happy Friday, everybody. Uh, I know I'm in between you. Maybe I'm in between you and happy hour. Hopefully we'll keep you engaged here. Uh, I also would like to get to happy hour. So let's let's have a fun, get through this presentation and talk a little bit about why developers struggle or seemingly struggle with AppSec and some ways we can make it easier uh, on our developer partners. Again, I'm Scott Gerlach and uh, introduce me a little bit, uh, CSO co-founder here at Stackhawk. Uh, I was the CISO at SendGrid for about three years. Uh, I did many, many roles at GoDaddy for almost 10. I'm also a husband, golfer, guitar player, tinkerer, brewer, like, you know, you name it. I got hobbies, man. I got hobbies. Um, if you want to get a hold of me, you can definitely reach me at uh, on Twitter and on LinkedIn there. Uh, I would love to talk about AppSec and, and AppSec programs with you if you want. Uh, really quickly, let's talk about this AppSec problem overview. Uh, obviously, we're in the OWASP channel here. We're in an OWASP event. So AppSec is really good in theory, uh, but it's super tough in practice. And we're going to talk about why that is today. But let's level set a little bit and talk about some of the things that you can use to test application security and application security postures, just to make sure everyone's on the same page. So. There's a, there's a handful of things that we can test with. One of them is static code analysis. So you've got static application security testing, which is looking at source code. You've also got software composition analysis. What libraries am I using to build my application? And those things just look at written source code, uh, library versions. They don't really have a good context of how the application works, but they know exactly the line items where things work. So that's really kind of interesting and awesome, powerful. Uh, sometimes that can be a little noisy because of that lack of knowledge of how the application works. So you can get a lot of false positives or a wall of alerts. We've also got dynamic code analysis, often referred to as DAST, so dynamic application security testing. And this is a little bit better at looking at the app, uh, the context of the application and understanding how it works and what is being presented to end users and potential threat actors. Uh, it's still somewhat noisy. Most of these are really hard to use. Uh, so they're really hard to kind of get up and running and figure out how to make work, how to consume the output, how to do lots of different stuff. Um, there are some good ones out there. I know of one at least. Uh, RASP, IAST, and WAF. These are awesome tools, but I think of them as the backstop for production. So if you do a good job through the development process of making sure you've got libraries in good shape, making sure you're writing the right kind of code, doing good testing, these kinds of tools are meant to be out in production, helping you prevent unknown bad things from happening, hopefully, and not blocking legitimate users. And that last part is where it gets a little sticky sometimes. So legit activity happening uh, in an application, RASP and I asked and WAF can sometimes identify that as illegit activity or the other way around. Uh, and sometimes that's a little difficult. But I wanna talk about some of the problems with uh, a lot of these tools and, and, and application security programs and, and how we are as security professionals making this maybe harder than it should be for our uh, engineering partners. So problem one is kind of this idea of the benevolent security team. And I know no security team thinks of themselves this way, but uh, this is kind of how sometimes they present themselves and that becomes a problem. Uh, and the, the hard truth of the matter here is you can never hire as many AppSec people as the organization can hire developers. The security team often makes this kind of whole thing a lot harder in the name of accountability. Uh, but really what they're doing is making people go slow or causing interruptions because they can't scale with the business. They can't scale with engineering teams. Um, and it, it turns into a bottleneck. It turns into a blocker or a gatekeeper, and it's not good. And a couple of the things that are causing this thing, uh, trust issues being one of them. So way, way, way before COVID pandemic, I don't know if you guys remember the time before COVID, I barely do. Uh, Charlie actually tweeted a thing about, he's talking to my good friend Colleen about, uh, I'm not sure if a new hire dev is in a position to evaluate risk for a feature product or company. I think professional security people can do this better. And I mean, sort of, right? Sort of. The hard truth of the matter is 
a new hire developer isn't making these decisions in a vacuum anyway. They're making them with the input from their other team members or people they work with or engineers or leadership in engineering. And so they're not doing this in a vacuum already. It's just that we as security folk think that they're doing that in a vacuum and we don't have access or inputs to how they're making those decisions. So we don't trust them to make solid decisions. And when we do, oftentimes we lack the context of what they're doing. So they come to us and go, hey, should we do blah, whatever that thing is. And we sometimes lack the context of why and what are we trying, what's the goal we're trying to achieve. And it just turns into a, yeah, don't do that. Uh, and so both of those things turn into a thing that is not healthy, not good, does not uh, create collaboration. In fact, creates silos. The way that I think about this is a little bit more like this. Uh, I wouldn't want to put a new hire developer in the position of making an uninformed risk decision. And this is much different than what how Charlie phrased it, maybe not what he meant, but how he phrased it. Uh, and so the whole point here is, if I can get you enough information for you to make somewhat of an informed decision, that's a much better position than making an uninformed decision or not making a decision at all. So both of those things, uh, they're a little bit similar, but they're a little different at the same time. Uh, the other thing that happens here is sometimes to combat this trust issue, oftentimes security teams come up with this awesome new idea and it's called, let's teach them how to do our job. Um, at best, it's misguided. At worst, uh, it continues to drive division between dev and security teams. And it kind of sometimes comes off like this. Hey, you're, you don't know how to do your job very well, but I can teach you how to do my job so that you, I can scale out my job uh, and you have to learn all the things that I know already because uh, you're not doing a good job at engineering or something like that. It just it comes out weird. Uh, and then what happens is we teach them all these new acronyms and terminology. And, and then we go, oh, wait, wait, uh, did we level set? Do, we, do you know about risk and how to calculate risk? And uh, also, you know, the internet's bad, don't you? And then like, it's just this circle of out of context. It's not what we're, what they work on on a daily basis. It's not relevant to the things that they're trying to do, the goals they're trying to achieve. And if you ever have done one of these developer security programs, have you ever noticed who gets selected by the engineering team to go to these things? So usually the engineering leadership is like, I'm gonna send my top developers to this stuff. We're gonna do a train the trainers kind of a model. They're gonna come back and teach everybody all the stuff they learn. And at the end, when you talk to them, they say, it was really informative. I learned a ton of stuff. And then you come back a month later and you go, who did you help help teach this, these concepts to, or do it in practice or things that you fixed in the code base because of what you learned? And they almost always go, oh, nothing. I actually went back to my real job of doing features and bug fixing and pushing stuff out the door to create value for the business. So oftentimes this is really, really ineffective. There is a little tidbits of good things that happen in this, but the hardest part of this is we're teaching them in these vulnerable apps, which are good to learn in, but they're hard to teach developers in because they don't work like regular apps. They don't get built like regular, like regular apps. They don't have the context of what the business is actually trying to do like the applications that they're working in. The things that I've seen work best here are take uh, found application security issues in code bases that you work on, and teach the development team why that's bad in the context of their thing and show them what a better way is or collaborate with them on how can we fix that and go that way. That really keeps them in the context of, here's what I do for a living. When we do this out of context thing, it sort of feels like this sometimes. It's kind of the equivalent of the accounting team saying to leadership, after leadership goes, hey, we want to model a new price increase, the accounting team going, we can help you with that. But first we have to teach you how the GL works. Now the GL is a really complicated but easy system of debits and credits and everything equals zero at the end. And the accounting team or the exec team is just like, okay, cool. Uh, I just need to be able to make decisions quickly with the right information. So I feel like we as security professionals need to do a better job of giving them this information so that 
people can make informed decisions quickly. We also have this chase to perfection mentality. Uh, we have, it's kind of a nasty habit, right? Often we think about things in totalitarian terms like let's eliminate all of the risk. Let's patch everything. Don't do anything in the cloud. And the hard truth of the matter is businesses exist to take risk. And our job as information security professionals is to help guide the business on what risk to take and what risk to maybe not take. Even thinking you can solve a customer problem is in fact a risk as a business, like the whole beginning of a business is like a risk. Uh, so the business needs to be able to take measured and informed risk to operate and security teams should be no different. We need to help our development engineering partners understand and take these measured risks as we're, as we're trying to get features out the door, attract customers, grow the business, uh, deliver more features and all kinds of good stuff. Uh, the other thing that happens here, uh, ticketing as the primary interface. So if you're evaluating a security tool of some sort or fashion, and your first question is, can I push all of these issues to JIRA? You are not thinking about prioritizing fixing at all. You are thinking about documenting. Uh, and so this is the wrong way to go about thinking about how to help engineering prioritize stuff. So if you're not getting closer to the in-context finding delivery of information and helping people understand, so as people are writing code, as people are testing code in CICD, you're getting farther and farther away from that context and it makes it harder and harder and more expensive to be able to fix those things and prioritize them necessarily. Tooling should at least give you feedback in the command line or in CICD and at best in IDEs so that you can consume this and, you know, whether or not you consume it or how you consume it is a whole different thing. If you can't start here, you, ha you have a really big problem enabling uh, engineering teams. Now, that's all if you have a security team. If you don't have a security team, you're a small business, uh, you're still growing, you you know, you don't, you haven't afforded the capability of a security function. It's really hard to understand where to start any of this stuff. So you, you kind of land in this realm of like, okay, there's a hundred different things I could do. Which one should I prioritize as a CTO or a VP of Eng or an engineering manager or even a developer? Um, and so what kind of happens there is like, I got other stuff to do or hang on. Maybe this DevOps team that I've got knows something about this and can help me. Uh, so those things aren't great, but enabling process and tooling that can easily get people started quickly enabled into, I'm testing my application security. I understand what I should be doing with this stuff and I'm making active decisions is super important. Problem number two, AppSec tools are built for security teams. Uh, and this is really complicated and sometimes hard to understand the context of what you're looking at because of who most of the uh, products are built for. So we're gonna talk about the context of why that is, but a ton of security tools out there look like this. It's, I know you've seen a tool that looks like this. It's got all kinds of options, all kinds of buttons, all kinds of switches. There's a training program that comes along with it when you buy a tool. And if you gave an engineer access to this thing, uh, they'd probably hit the X or the little red circle or whatever operating system you're using uh, really quickly on this tool, or they'd make fun of it for a little bit and figure out how it was designed and who built it and how it was designed by committee and why they exposed everything and then they'd close it. So none of those things is, is what you want from your engineering team or for your engineering team. You want to engage them with those with tooling and information. Uh, and sometimes some of this stuff doesn't work very well. The other thing that happens with uh, tools being built for security teams is we play this game. We have invented a lot of really great new words to talk about application security issues and how to and how to fix them a little bit. Uh, mostly we just have a lot of wall of text about what an application security issue is. And this one is my favorite because it's the same thing, but two different terms or two different initializations of the same term. So that's even confusing to security professionals. Think about that from an engineering perspective. 
And ultimately, the real thing here is using anti-CSRF tokens or same site policy for browsers, but none of these things talk about that. And if you were to give this information to an engineer and they went, how do I fix this? The answer to them is probably, oh, the library or the framework that you're using probably has anti-CSRF tokens, turn them on and use them, which is not in any of these things. So that's an interesting thing that we, we try to do to our engineering teams is we try to invent new terminology and words that already describe problems that they're used to dealing with, input sanitization, cross-site scripting, SQL injection, command injection, input sanitization, output sanitization, um, tenancy filtering, so broken object level authorization. All of these things are terms that exist in development land, but we change them because they're in security land. Now there are good AppSec tools out there that work in kind of this developer native flow in the context of how they work, where they work, when they work. Uh, there's a couple different ones on here that are really good. The OWASP dependency check is obviously a good one. Um, PR bot, Dependabot, Sneak, Fossa, NPM Auto is a good one. Uh, <laughs> that last one is awesome. Um, but lastly, uh, and worst of all, probably all of these tools or most of these tools suffer from problem number three that I want to talk about, and that is the production bias. So the production bias is all about testing in production and testing when you get to production and all kinds of good stuff. And let's talk about why, first of all. First of all, the reason why that is, is because of the first two things we talked about. Security uh, tools, application security tools are built for security teams, security people, and production is just where they know the application the best. Or if they're a pen tester, it's the only place to have access to the, to the application. So understanding that uh, production application and its risk in production is how they work most of the time. Uh, and both of these groups are very fo focused on finding vulnerabilities and their value is driven, especially in pen test land, their value is driven out of how many things that they find. If you hired a pen test firm or had a pen test engagement and they came back and said, I didn't find anything. What would your initial thought be? Mm, we did a great job or probably not doing their job very well here. Uh-oh. So that's, that's an interesting thing that happens with this production bias uh, is we're more focused on the number of things found than finding and fixing the right things. Uh, it's also very inefficient because the, find, the people that do the finding are not the fixers of this thing. So there's this whole process and loop about how to get this information back to people who can fix. It also reinforces the adversarial relationship in kind of a when we find stuff as, app, as security professionals, we go, oh, look at it. I did my job really good. I found a problem. And it comes off to somebody else's, uh, you broke, I broke your thing, or you did a bad job doing the thing that you do. Isn't that awesome? Um, not awesome. Doesn't make people feel great. Doesn't establish and uh, back up that team mentality. And so what that looks like often is this. So I'm sure there are people out in the audience today that have done one or two of these things at some point. I have done both of these things, so don't feel bad if you are like looking at this going, wait, I, I do this. I've done both of these things. Uh, and what they look like is, hey, before you release this software, I have to give it the okay. And what, that, what happens there is my development team goes way faster than my application security person or couple of people, and I can't keep up. And so then eventually, uh leadership and managers in the company go okay so don't do that anymore i don't know why you're doing that it's not doing anything good for us and it's delaying our release to production and so then we go okay cool you just push that out into production and we'll come back around to it at some point uh, and then we play catch up and we're playing catch up with application security problems in production which is not awesome uh it's super inefficient again we still play that big loop game of I found stuff, I made a ticket, I got it prioritized, I got it back to the dev. The dev didn't understand how to recreate the issue, so I had to teach them how to recreate the issue. Now they've got to get the app running on their local machine again so that it actually runs and, oh, okay, now I fixed it. And it's still like six months, three months, six months, nine months, years later. 
Uh, but the biggest problem with this particular thing, and the one thing that I dislike about this methodology is the bugs are in production. So you necessarily have to push security issues into production to find them. And that's terrible because hopefully you find them first, hopefully someone else with nefarious activities or your bug bounty program doesn't find them before you do because either way they cost you money. Uh, and hopefully they're not super easy to find. Those are the worst kinds of things to pay out bug bounty on uh, and to respond to security researchers and threat actors and all kinds of stuff is stuff you could easily find before you got to production. This is also very frustrating for software engineers because the security team runs infrequent scans of code that's already in production. And then they engage in that ticket shuffling again. And the engineering team has long moved on to another sprint or another epic or another something else by the time they get this information back. And again, we have to restart this whole like, what, what was I even working on when we did that? How do I get this running again? All kinds of good stuff super ineffective and inefficient now there may be times when you intentionally ship a bug or security bug to production and that is an, as a good informed decision with product and engineering and security being able to go hey i know that there's a security problem here the risk is low the likelihood is low we should ship this anyway and we'll quickly come back and fix it as a fast follow that's an awesome informed decision to make that is much, much different than, I'm pretty sure it's good, let's ship it. Or don't ship it till I check it out. And I've got a lot of other things to do. So I'm going to be pretty busy for the next week. So I'm going to hold up your deployment for a week. That doesn't help you meet customer demands or customer commitments and turns into this blocker process again. Let's talk a little bit of how to get started kind of the right way or what I think is the right way. Uh, and the very first thing about this is I think uh, security tests and security testing should work the exact same way other software testing does. And that is, uh, you know, when a unit test breaks, you know that the code's not working because the unit test doesn't work and the integration test doesn't work and something's broken because the compiler can't make a binary out of, uh, out of the code that you wrote. There's lots of ways to do testing uh, whether it's unit tests, functional tests, integration tests, compiler tests, security testing should be just like that, should just act like that. You should be able to recreate these tests locally so that when you get code into a CI CD system and you're doing security testing there as well, it's not a black box. You could recreate this locally if you wanted to, to be able to test and do it locally, just like unit testing and integration tests. It shouldn't be a black box thing that exists in, in development that doesn't give you feedback, doesn't tell you what's happening. You can't reproduce it, but it breaks your build. That's never a good thing. Um, and so when a team introduces a vulnerability, they should know because it fails a security test in some form or fashion. And what that looks like on our DevOps Mobius is over on, this is where the shift left term comes from, right? On the left side of our Mobius here during coding and building and testing is where security testing should primarily live. Like you can test in that deploy and operate space, but that not, should not be the first place you test. The first place you test should be back there in that code build and test part of this loop. Instrumenting those tests in CICD, giving immediate feedback and the ability to, for an engineer to stay in context of what they're building, when they're building it, how they're building it, and differentials. So if I make a new code commit and a new issue shows up, it's probably in that code that I just wrote or could just committed. So I don't have to go looking all over the app necessarily. I can look in what I just added. <clears throat> Lots of uh, our customers check for security bugs on every PR or MR or whatever merging strategy you particularly have. And that gives the test information directly back to those engineers as they're working on it. Engineers are smart. People that are writing software for businesses and companies to create value are really smart. Let them be smart. Uh, security teams tend to want to approve everything. Uh, and what that means is other people can't make decisions. You, you've taken them out of the whole entire decision loop if you are approving their decisions. They're not making decisions, they're making suggestions and you're approving it. 
allow this kind of technology to spark collaboration between development and security, but enable devs to do their work, enable them to do self-serve, figure out and fix problems. And if they make the wrong decision, that's okay too, but they've made a decision and documented it. So that is really, really good. Now you can have a conversation as an AppSec professional about a, with a development team about decisions that they made and why you think they might be wrong and why they think they might be right. That's a good discussion to have and a good partnership. Business risk is all collaboration and no one team knows the answer to any of these questions or outcomes. If you're doing this, remember, you might end up in a therapy session. It might get a little rough for a little bit, um, but it's doable. It is totally doable to partner with an engineering team and change their perception about the information security team as a partner and someone who enables them as, as opposed to a blocker and or security ninjas who are like, Shh, you guys made a mistake. I dropped out of the ceiling. Don't do that. Uh, lastly, the most important part here is just start. Like if you've got an application security program and it's not making good headway, restart. If you don't have an application security program and you're trying to start one, start. Start with a small team, a small engineering team, help become their partner, help give them information, choose an application and their CICD pipeline, get them the information they need, uh, choose a technology. I personally like SCA and DAST because those two things are actionable in two different ways and they both give you really good information. Once that's working, iterate and expand out to the other rest of the organization. They'll probably be your champion as engineering teams if you do it well. They'll talk to their other development partners and friends and say, hey, actually, the information security team is helping us. The application security team is helping us, and we're going faster, and we're producing better code. You should talk to those guys. Or girls, sorry. I don't, I don't mean to be exclusive. I mean, you know, general guys. Uh, lastly, that was, that's it for my time, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to me. Hopefully, you're enjoying your late Friday afternoon. I know I am. It's happy hour time. Time to get down. Uh, if you're already past happy hour, then, you know, drive safe.